Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. I welcome you all to the Hindu analysis for today. It's the first of October, beginning of a new month. I really hope that your preparation is going on in full steam. I also hope that you are now a part of the Telegram channel of Baiju's Exam Prep IAS, where you will get all the latest current affairs updates for the UPSC examination. If you have still not joined the channel, please don't wait up. Use the link given in the description of the video and join the channel right away. Let's begin with the first article that is about the draft telecommunication bill that has just been published for public consultation by the government of India about 10 days back. There have been multiple articles written on this bill. Some people saying it's a very good bill. It's a beginning of something very, very good in the telecommunication sector in India. While on the other hand, there have been many people who have criticized the bill. The two authors of this article are on the latter side. They are criticizing the bill for a lot of different provisions. In fact, they are making a point that this was a great opportunity for the government to actually make sure that our telecommunication sector in the long run is ready to face all the future challenges. However, they say that we have in fact taken a step back and we have made the telecommunication sector even more dependent and centralized on the government's power. They are making multiple points for this. They say that the government of India has now introduced a new licensing regime. The pre-independence era laws have been reintroduced and they have just been termed as reforms. But in reality, the new telecom bill is nothing like the reforms that we had expected. They also say that the telecom bill will now have stricter regulations and centralized power. How? The government will decide over licenses for the telecommunication exercise. However, the most debatable point of the bill is that online communication service providers such as WhatsApp, Apple Watch, etc. will now also come under this particular definition and they will also need permission from the government. The other debatable point of the bill is about the OTT platforms. Now, let's take an example of Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hotstar. These kind of OTD platforms, they actually make a lot of money by people subscribing to their platform and watching all the content. However, do understand this. When I am watching Netflix or when you are watching Hotstar, you are actually using internet to watch all that content. That internet is not because of Netflix or Hotstar. That internet is available to you, available to me because of the infrastructure that has been put in by the telecom companies. Geo. Airtel, V, these are the companies that have set up the telecom infrastructure using which we can actually access OTD platforms. In other words, if tomorrow the telecommunication infrastructure does not work, the OTD platforms will come down to zero. That is why the government says that we need to regulate the OTD platforms as well. In fact, under this draft telecom bill, the OTT services are now to be treated at a similar level as the telecom companies as well. This is where the authors have a different point of view. The authors say that by treating the OTD companies in the same manner as the telecom companies, you are actually not allowing them to innovate. It is not the responsibility of the OTD companies to build telecom infrastructure, to look at the government licensing, to look at how internet usually works. They should be left for making content and doing their own business. So bringing these two different kind of businesses, that is telecom and OTT platforms under one single definition goes against the entire idea of innovation. Also, as per the authors, the government can also misuse its power to issue licenses. How? For example, WhatsApp now has to take a license from the government of India to operate because it is a communication app and it uses a telecom infrastructure. Now, in exchange for giving license, the government may ask WhatsApp and other kind of services to store their data in India locally, something that the government had been trying to do for a long, long time. Also, this particular draft communication bill has other provisions such as the government can actually require OTT communication service providers such as WhatsApp, etc. to disclose any messages to the authorized officer. Again, this goes back to the idea that by making it compulsory to have license from the government, the government now has huge powers over these platforms, powers to decide how these platforms will work, power to actually hand twist any of these platforms into disclosing any information which they would not like earlier. 
This goes against the entire concept of right to privacy, which is a part of our fundamental rights, as said by the Supreme Court as well, and by the Justice B. N. Shri Krishna Committee. Both of these have been ignored by this draft telecommunication bill. In fact, the draft telecommunication bill, for the first time, talks about power to suspend internet services as well that have been used by the government in many parts of the country. The authors here say that the bill does not refer to Anuradha Bhasin case of 2020. Now, let me tell you what this case was. In 2020, the Supreme Court said in this case that the power to shut down internet services can be utilized by the government only in extreme cases and only in those areas where it is a necessity because right to freedom of speech and expression is a fundamental right and taking away the power of internet goes against that and that is why this is something that the government should be very very careful with this is what the supreme court had said in the anuradha bhasin case but this also has been neglected Thus, the authors say that the draft telecommunication bill could have been so, so much better, but the government has lost this opportunity and rather given itself all the powers that it requires. This is a tweet from the Union Minister of Telecom, that is Ashwini Vaishnav, where he had actually invited people to give their views on this draft Indian telecommunication bill. Remember, this is not an uncommon practice. For a lot of bills, government does ask the people's opinion as well by putting it in the public domain. Now, apart from the ones that have been mentioned in this particular article, there are some other concerns as well with respect to the telecommunication industry and the draft telecommunication bill. For example, there is a big issue on insolvency of telecoms. See, telecom business is a very, very tough business to run. Big companies often run into huge losses because they have to ensure that their services are being provided to the people at the cheapest cost possible. It's an extremely capital intensive business because to get spectrum from the government, you need to give a lot of money to the government. So a lot of telecommunication companies such as IDEA, etc. have become insolvent. The DOT, that is the Department of Telecommunication, proposes that if a telecom company gets insolvent or does not have money, becomes bankrupt, then the spectrum which was given to them will go back to the center government. The bill also says that the center government has the power to differ or convert into equity just like they did with IDEA or to write off any licensing fee or any financial stress from the telecom companies. The government also is planning to replace USOF. USOF is Universal Service Obligation Fund. Now, this was actually a fund that was taken from the telecom companies as a part of 5% of their universal service levy. It was charged on all the telecom fund operators on their gross revenue. Remember, gross revenue, not gross profit, gross revenue. So this was a huge, huge sum. This USOF was supposed to be used to give a boost to the rural telecom infrastructure in the country. Now, the government of India is planning to replace this with something called a Telecommunication Development Fund. This USOF, in fact, was seen as one of the biggest reasons why multiple telecom companies such as IDEA were pushed into bankruptcy as well. The next article that we have here is written because the 1st of October is marked by the United Nations as the International Day for Older People. This article is mainly based on the World Population Prospects 2022 report that is published by the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. In simple terms, the headline of the report is that in 2050, the world will have a large number of elderly people and thus the infrastructure, specifically the health infrastructure across the world, needs to be prepared to handle that. India specifically will have a big problem at our hands. 16% of the world's population by 2050 will be of people over 65 years of age. They will specifically require a lot of care, including eye care service delivery, which is almost a necessity with every elderly person in the entire world. The same report says that by 2050, the number of people of 65 years and above will be twice as many as children under 5. India's population by 2050 will be 1.7 billion, much, much more than that of China. Thus, 
not just the other countries, but India also has to work very, very hard on building robust healthcare infrastructure, especially targeted at the elderly population in the country. This article, as I said, mentions mostly the requirement of ensuring good eye care for the elderly healthy people. The reason why they are doing this is because of a study conducted by Hyderabad Ocular Mobility in elderly homes. As per this study, over 30% of the elderly had a distance vision loss and over 50% had near vision impairment. Thus, it is actually a given that with increasing age, people will have some problem in their vision. And any problem in the ability to see clearly can have a lot of impact on physical and on the mental health. Just imagine a person who has been independent all throughout his life. All of a sudden, if they have some problem in their vision and they're not able to see properly, they all of a sudden become dependent on other people. That has a major impact on how they live life physically as well as mentally. This is just one of the big problems that the elderly face. Elderly also face a problem of hearing, mobility, etc. Apart from mental health issues, if they have some issues in the family. That is why the government should try and ensure that there is availability of cheap portable devices to ensure that this problem is actually handled. And the government may also give subsidy to ensure that elderly people who can't afford very, very expensive healthcare facilities can also get at least the basic health amenities that they require. This is how in the coming decades, the elderly population is expected to increase decade on decade. Now, this has two big reasons. First, the rate of population growth is decreasing with increasing education, with people being more aware, the number of children who are being born year after year, especially in developed nations and even in developing nations is decreasing. Thus, the number of people entering the workforce is declining. On the other hand, with improving healthcare facilities, with improving healthcare infrastructure, we have a situation where people are living much longer lives. So on both ends of the bargain, you have a situation where the number of people entering the workforce is lower, while the number of people who have to be supported through pension, through welfare schemes is actually increasing. That is what is actually increasing the burden on the government. The government of India has also realized this. And thus, in the past decade or so, there have been multiple initiatives from the government side to help the elderly population. These are a few examples that you can see on the screen. We have the Pradhan Mantri Vay Vandana Yojana. We have the Integrated Program for Older Persons, the Rashtriya Vayoshri Yojana, Sampanna Project, the Sacred Portal for Elderly, Elder Line, so on and so forth. These are just some of the examples of how the government is trying to ensure that the elderly population in India is taken care of for food, shelter and their medical expenses specifically. The next article that we have is that the US government, specifically the US Treasury Department, recently announced that they are putting sanctions on multiple companies across the country for dealing in Iranian oil despite the sanctions. This includes an Indian company as well called Tibalaji. This is a Mumbai based company and the allegation is that they were actually taking oil products from Iran and then they were passing it off to other countries such as China without telling them what was the origin of this product. This is the first Indian entity to face such sanctions under the US sanction regime for Iran. As you know, when Donald Trump became the president of the US, the US walked out of the Iran nuclear deal called the JCPOA and thus asked India and other nations not to buy oil from Iran because that will impose sanctions on them. Thus, India took the decision in 2019 to stop buying oil from Iran and we substituted that by buying oil from other nations, including the US as well. The US Treasury Department said that the sanctions may be reversed if Iran again comes under the nuclear deal and ensures compliance for everything that the US is asking for. As you know, the US and Iran, along with other European countries, are right now still undergoing negotiations in Vienna to bring back this JCPOA deal. But till the time that the deal actually comes back on the table, anyone who deals in Iranian oil will have to face sanctions from the US. Now, I wanted to show you a very interesting table. 
This is a table of the countries from where India imports its crude oil. So these numbers are actually in percentage form. That is how much percentage of oil does India import from these nations. And this column that you see is actually financial year. So if you see financial year 23, financial year 23 means from April 2022 till March 2023. So this is the ongoing financial year. If you can see Iran is in the second column here. After 2019 from Iran, we have not bought any oil as we just discussed. On the other hand, if you see which is the country from where we are buying the most oil these years, that is Iraq. The last column is for Iraq. Then we also buy significant amount of oil from Saudi Arabia. And the interesting entry over here is of the US. If you see US here. Now, ever since we have stopped buying oil from Iran, we had to find some other country from where we can actually take oil. And this is where US has come into the picture. The reason why it has declined in this financial year, that is the number from US, is because if you can see, the number from Russia has increased considerably. It has reached 14%, earlier it used to be 2%, 1% or 0. Because of the cheap oil they are giving, it has now increased to 14%. So this is the current basket in terms of percentage of the oil that we are importing from various nations. Now one interesting part is, that after the pandemic has almost ended now, the demand for crude oil in the country has increased. So as you can see, the demand for oil, that is petrol, diesel, even LPG, has reached the pre-pandemic level and has even increased as compared to pre-pandemic level. Meaning that eventually we need to buy oil. So it would be in the interest of everyone if Iran is allowed to sell oil again. That would also mean that India might not have to buy that much oil from Russia. In fact, in the recent SCO summit, where Iran was formally inducted as an SCO member, there were discussions that Iran may make a comeback as an oil exporter to India, provided that they sort out their issues with the US in the ongoing negotiations. The next article that we have is a news coming in from Russia, where Vladimir Putin has forcefully annexed four regions of Ukraine. These are Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, Kherson. All these have now been made a part of Russia forcefully. Obviously, Ukraine or the other Western nations or the UN do not agree to this. But Russian president has said that we have had a referendum in these four regions and over 96% of people said that they want to be a part of Russia and thus we are making them a part of Russia. These are the four leaders of these areas appointed by the Russian president himself. That is why this has not really been accepted as official by any of the countries, including the closest friends of Russia, such as China as well. Now, the war between Russia and Ukraine, which is ongoing since the month of February, has actually seen a lot of changes happening from one side to the other. However, this is said to be the biggest provocation of Ukraine that is annexing the Ukrainian territory. The same thing was done by Russia in 2014 when they annexed the Crimea Peninsula, saying that we have held a referendum in Crimea and most of the people want to join Russia. Altogether, that is Crimea and these four areas make up around 20% of the territory of Ukraine. Now this comes in just the next day after there was a very, very nasty attack in Zaporizhia where 25 civilians were killed and their bodies were spread on the roads. Russia says that these kind of attacks are now done by Ukrainian army and not us, but the entire world believes it is Russia behind these attacks. Now, just to give you a clear idea, where are these regions and why are they important? These are the four regions that we are talking about. Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. Crimea, as you know, was already annexed by Russia in 2014. The reason why Russia wanted these four regions is that now Russia can have land connectivity to Crimea through these regions. That is why Russia's plan always was to ensure that these regions are in control of Russia. Before this, Russia could only reach Crimea through water, but now they have direct connectivity from land. Also remember, even before the war had begun, Luhansk and Donets were almost under Russian control only. So, it was actually Russian people only that were running these areas even before the war started. So remember, 
with the war the two major areas that ukraine have lost now is zaporizhia and kherson this is what russia now says now just today as you know in the un there was a vote organized by the western nations against russia's illegal referendum on ukraine india has abstained from voting india has reiterated the demand that we want an end to all the violence that is going on in ukraine but we have not voted on this we have abstained from voting thus maintaining the middle line once again between russia and the western nations the next article that we have is sebi again tightening norms for ipo that is initial public offering what has happened is in the past few months we have seen a lot of companies bringing in their ipos and then their stock prices going down considerably many people say that the ipos actually have become a way for the companies to just gather as much money as possible and not to give value to the shareholders that is why sebi is now trying to ensure that we have much stricter norms for the ipo sebi has cleared the proposal to mandate issuer issuer means a company to disclose their offer price based on past transactions and fundraising activities means before they make their company public if they took money from anyone any investor on what valuation did they take the money all of that has to be made public so that the people know how much money are they paying for the stocks sebi also approved a proposal for alternative mechanism by permitting pre filing of offer documents for companies who are contemplating ipos so those who want to bring their companies to the market those who want to make their companies public in the form of ipo that is initial public offering they would have to pre fill certain documents so that they can actually tell the people many more information about their company so that the people can decide if they want to buy the stocks or not this will not include any sensitive information now those of you who know what is ipo great those who don't know ipo simply means initial public offering it's a process by which a private company can get listed in the stock exchange and they can offer their shares to the people in an ipo the company is listed in the stock exchange and then the people can now buy and sell the stocks shares etc sebi that is the security and exchange board of india has a responsibility of regulating the companies especially when they become public for an ipo to be introduced all the documentation from the side of the sebi has to be fulfilled by the companies and all these documents contain information such as company promoters means the people who actually formed the company who are the founders the projects of the company financial details the date of issue etc sebi is a statutory body that came into being in 1992 that regulates the stock market in the country now this is not the first time that sebi has introduced such reforms for ipo this is a common kind of a news such as these reforms that you see on the screen were actually introduced in 2021 that is the companies that actually raise money from the market in the form of ipo should clearly tell where are they going to use the funds are they just keeping in the pocket or are they using it to expand the business not more than 35% of the ipo money should be used for general growth initiatives 50% of the anchor allotment should be funds willing to lock in for 90 days anchor allotment means see when in an ipo either common people like you me retail people can invest or big banks or big investment organizations can invest they are called anchor investment if a big company has invested in the ipo they would have to lock in their money for at least 90 days they can't take out money before that these are some of the initiatives or reforms that sebi had introduced in 2021 itself so this is not something new that reforms in ipo has been introduced these were the important articles from the hindu newspaper today now a couple of practice questions number 1 in the light of the draft telecom bill assess the impact of bringing ott platforms under the same norms as the telecom companies in india second how prepared is india to handle the growing elderly population in the country give suitable examples both these questions have to be answered within 250 words each thank you so much for watching the video have a good day ahead